Thanks, Matt, very much. Keep um, Romans 4 open in front of you, and um, if you haven't torn it up, there is a handout, and you can follow along there. Okay, how's about this for starters? Faith. Faith is the great cop-out, the great excuse to evade the need to think and evaluate evidence. Faith is belief in spite of, even perhaps because of, the lack of evidence. Richard Dawkins, surprise, surprise. And I wonder what you make of that. Because whilst that is the kind of polar end of uh, the, the kind of new atheist view of faith, it is a view, I think, that's trickled down into popular culture. Where when you talk to your friends about faith, that, something of that, I think, is probably what they have in mind. The kind of um, fingers crossed, hope for the best approach to life. Um, the sort of wishful thinking, the, the leap in the proverbial dark. Blind optimism, they might say. Blind optimism um, despite an apparent lack of evidence. Or, indeed, more strongly, blind evidence, as Dawkins would say, because of the lack of evidence. Well, for the last three weeks, as we've been in Romans 3 and 4, faith has been what Paul has been all about. And specifically, the righteousness that is by faith. Week one in Romans chapter three, we learnt about the righteousness that comes from God. A righteousness that is not innate within us in any sense, but that he will give to anyone who will put their trust in him. I wonder how you feel as you come to church tonight. Do you feel like someone who deserves to be accepted by God? I doubt it. Well, if you feel unacceptable, the wonderful news of Romans three was that God will accept you because... By faith, he will give us righteousness. Then we moved into week two and into Romans chapter four, and we learned there that this righteousness that God would give was apart from works, apart from works, i.e. there was nothing that we could do to earn it by rights. Instead, it had to be given to us by grace, a free gift. There is no pay slip that we will get given to us at the end of time that will say, Jamie Child earned a certain level of righteousness. It is purely by grace as a gift, apart from works. And then last week, we saw that this righteousness from God comes apart from circumcision and law. Those two great Jewish marker posts that were distinct to them as a nation. Wonderful blessings from God but apart from this righteousness. And because it was apart from circumcision and apart from law and by faith, it could be for everyone and for all of the nations, such that the promise to Abraham could come true. And this thread of faith has run all the way through chapter 4. By faith, by faith, he believed, he believed. We've seen it again and again. But throughout the chapter, it's almost as, as though faith has been defined negatively. It's by faith and not by works. It's by faith and not by circumcision. It's by faith and not by law. It's not, not, not. And there's a very good reason for that. The reason being that you and I and every single person who's ever lived is by nature a self-justifier. We're always looking for ways to to justify ourselves. And so Paul has given an exhaustive chapter and a half to to almost beat that self-justification out of us. It doesn't take a lot, does it, for us to justify ourselves. I've only got to put a yogurt pot in a recycling bin to sort of feel warm and gooey about myself. Um, the advertisers know it, don't they? Well, I walked past a shop the other day that was selling uh, a food, and the branding was, um, it was called Naturally Righteous. And you can guess what kind of food they were selling. Uh, it was muesli and that kind of thing. Because you feel better about yourself after a bowl of muesli, don't you? In a way you don't after a fry-up. We, we just find ways to justify ourselves. And so for a chapter and a bit, Paul has been beating the inner lawyer out of us. Our in-house legal team has taken a battering. This instinct to self-justify needs persuading out of us. But having shown that it must be by faith and that it's wonderful that it is by faith, now Paul wants positively to define faith, to give us a, a model, if you like, of what faith truly looks like. And if you asked Paul, what does true faith look like? He would have said that true faith is faith like Abraham's. First heading on your outline there. Faith like Abraham's. Abraham is the model of faith. He is the example of faith. He is the gold standard of faith. Now, I'm aware as I, as I say that, 
uh, of the danger that your in-house legal team starts to get back on their feet. Because when we talk about Abraham's faith, it's just possible, depending on what your temperament is like, that you might look at the example of Abraham and think to yourself either, hey, wonderful, I've got faith like Abraham, well done me, or I, I haven't got faith like Abraham and despair. And in so doing, turn the faith of Abraham into a work in some way. Well, if you feel your inner lawyer rearing their head, do what we should do with all lawyers and lock them in a room for a little while. I'm married to a lawyer, by the way, so that was, a, that was clearly a joke. No, observe, observe what Abraham's faith is in, first of all. Abraham's faith is in God who gives life from the dead. It's in God who gives life from the dead. You see, faith, by its very nature, by definition, cannot be something that merits Because faith always is in something else. There is always an object to faith. Uh, Say, for example, there is a, a ravine that I need to cross. And there is a bridge across that ravine. And it's, it's well engineered. I can see it's sturdy. And I decide to trust in it. And I step out onto the bridge and it carries my weight. Now, who or what takes the credit for the fact that I don't go tumbling down into the ravine? Is it me because of my faith? No, of course not. It is the bridge in which I have put my trust. That takes the credit. Faith cannot be a work. And in Abraham's case, he was putting his trust in God, and specifically the God who gives life from the dead. Have a look down at verse 17. Abraham was given these wonderful promises. Uh, We saw them in Genesis 15. He said, I have, uh, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. That promise was made in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. You see, Abraham didn't just sit down one Sunday afternoon as the rain was falling and think to himself, what faith system can I come up with? I don't like the world the way it is. It's so pessimistic. I want something I can put my trust in. What can I make up? No, Abraham believed in the God who was there. Specifically, the God, first of all, who was revealed in creation. Uh, In verse 17, did you see that, that description of God? The God who calls into existence the things that do not exist. That, I think, is reference to the the initial act of creation in the first place. If you remember back to Genesis chapter 1, you will remember that in the beginning there was nothing. I mean nothing, 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 nothing. And then God called into existence things that did not exist. That's what he's like. He's the creator, God. And in the creation, therefore, he is revealed. Uh, Romans chapter 1, in fact, if you were to turn back to verses 19 and 20, describe how the creation reveals that there is a God. Uh, you look at the, uh, the creation, and it speaks of a creator. Uh, it's written in the creation almost that there is a God and that, there is, that he is very powerful. And Abraham knew that. Abraham knew, I guess like all of us, that nothing comes from nothing. If you see something... There must be a first cause. And rather than suppress that truth that was revealed in the creation, Abraham believed it. He believed that there was a God who could call into existence things that do not exist. He didn't deny that truth, but believed it. Not irrationally, not because he'd lost it for a moment, but because he just observed what was in front of him and believed it. Believed that behind the creation was a God who calls into existence the things that do not exist. Not in spite of the lack of evidence, but because of it. He believed in the God who was the creator, first of all. But he didn't simply believe that there was a God. He believed in the God who made promises to him. So to put it differently, you could say that Abraham didn't reason his way to God. It might have sounded like that from the way I described it a moment ago. He didn't reason his way to God. Rather, God broke into his world and revealed himself to him. There was general revelation in the creation, but Abraham then received specific, special revelation from God. Have a look down at verse 18. Speaking of Abraham, it says, In hope he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. 
We read about it in Genesis 15 just a few moments ago. God broke into his world and revealed himself to Abraham. And Abraham put his trust in that God, the God who was revealed in the covenant promises, the God who is behind the covenant promises in the first place. You sometimes hear people say, don't you, I like to think of God as dot, dot, dot. I believe in God, they would say. And then they kind of make a God up that they believe in. But that wasn't Abraham. He received a specific revelation of God and what he was like in his covenant promises. And he put his faith in that God. It's the same God who was revealed day after day in the Bibles that you've got on your laps. He was broken into our creation and revealed himself to us. Now, Abraham didn't just believe in the concept of God. He believed in the God who had revealed himself to him. And he didn't just intellectually assent to the idea of God. Verse 18, in hope he believed. In hope he believed. Those two words, in hope, they speak, don't they, of, a, of an investment of ourselves. The whole of Abraham's being, not just his mind, but his heart and his will, aligned. Believing in hope. Again, sometimes you come across people who, uh, who like to think that you can believe in God and do what you want. I believe in God, they say, but when you look at their lives, there is nothing that matches up with the fact that they believe in God. And that, if I may suggest, is either intellectually very lazy or intellectually dishonest. Because to say that you believe in something and then act as though it didn't exist, well, it's just incoherent. It's dishonest, lazy. It would be like, Walking up to one of these chairs and saying, yeah, no, I'm thoroughly convinced it can take my weight. I could sit on it uh, and it would carry me. But then to refuse to sit for the rest of the evening and to spend your time circulating around the evening standing because you don't actually believe it. No, Abraham believed in hope he believed. Everything was aligned in line with what he knew to be true about the God who had revealed himself to him. He was invested in it. He was obedient to that God. He took, took action in the light of what he believed. Not in such a way that he merited salvation. Let's be clear again. But because he believed in God, he acted in line with it. His works flowed out of his faith. Abraham believed in the God who gives life from the dead. He believed specifically in his promises. And he believed that despite appearances. Despite appearances. You can imagine what it must have been like for Abraham, can't you? He was, we're told, about 100 years old. What must it have been like going around mother care, bulk buying nappies, when you're 100 years old, hearing the sniggering coming from behind the counter? Or you go into Toys R Us to buy one of those mobiles that you buy for babies, and they ask you which of your great-great-grandchildren it's for. But despite the evidence that was in front of him, Abraham believed. Verse 19. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God. He didn't waver. He was consistent in his faith. And that was because Abraham knew that beyond what he could see was the invisible God's. Beyond his finite existence was a God who is infinite. Beyond the material was a God for whom our impossibilities are immaterial. Abraham trusted in this God, despite the evidence and where it pointed. Now, it might be when we talk about these kind of things that this is where the idea of the the leap in the dark comes from. Again, that that Dawkins kind of articulates and that others have articulated. That faith is very simply a leap in the dark. But simply because Abraham acted against what the material world was telling him, that doesn't mean it was all of a sudden unreasonable or irrational. Especially not when the God who is beyond that material has broken in and demonstrated himself to you. Now, Actually, it's more reasonable to go with the God who is behind the creation than to where the creation points us in the first place. And it's good to know that. You see, containing these verses is a little warning as to what our creation is like, as to how sometimes it can be misleading to to live in this world. 
Sometimes it tells us lies about uh, the way the world is. I don't know if you've ever looked at the way other people live or the way things seem to go so often and have wondered, is God really there? Can I really trust him? The creation can be misleading, and it certainly was for Abraham as he looked at, uh, at his state and the state of his wife. If he'd gone purely with what was in front of him, with what he could see with his eyes, well, he would have gone a very different direction. But Abraham lived by faith and not by sight. It's good to know that. It's good to know it because when we live by it, we will find that our faith grows stronger. That was what happened for Abraham. His faith grew strong. Uh, Halfway down uh, through um, verse 20. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. Now, some have observed, going back to Genesis 15 through 17, that when you read that story about Abraham, he doesn't always come across as the model of faith. Uh, He sometimes seems actually pretty flaky when it comes to uh, how his faith looked and what his faith was like. But it's striking, isn't it, that even as Paul reads that account of Abraham's faith, nonetheless, he sees there a core of faith running through. I think it's quite encouraging because my faith is a little bit like that. It goes up and down, and I'm guessing yours is too. Well, Paul can read that account and nonetheless say Abraham's faith didn't waver. Indeed, as you read through, and as Paul reads through, he decides that actually Abraham's faith grew stronger. And if you read through Genesis 15 through 16, 17, 18, 19, through to 22, you will see that in Genesis 22, there was a supreme act of faith on Abraham's part. Supreme act of faith in the God who brings life from the dead. Abraham was called to the top of Mount Moriah, called to sacrifice his one and only son, the child of the promise. And Abraham was willing to do that, willing to give him up, hand him over to death, because Abraham knew that there was a God who could bring life from the dead. Over the course of his life, I guess Abraham had learned that he could trust in this God, and his faith grew strong to the point where he was willing to sacrifice even the child of the promise. How? Well, as he gave glory to God. That's the phrase that Paul uses there. Do you see it? As he gave glory to to God, the end of verse 20. What does it mean to give glory to God? I I guess it means simply to treat God as God, to trust him and to live in the light of that, to bring your life into line with who he is, out of determination to bring glory to him. Well, that's what Abraham did, and he did it over the course of a lifetime, and as he did it, his faith grew stronger and stronger and stronger. You see, in some ways, faith is a bit like a a muscle. Um, There was a day when I used to lift weights before I got married, and then that all went away. And uh, the principle with lifting weights is that you resist. There's a weight that resists, and it breaks down the muscle. But as it does, so the muscle grows stronger and stronger and stronger. Well, faith is a bit like that. It comes up against the difficult things in life. It is resisted. But as you determine to live by faith, And as you overcome those hurdles by faith, so the faith grows stronger. That is what true biblical Abrahamic faith does. And that is Abraham's faith. Faith in the God who gives life from the dead. Faith in his promises. Faith despite appearances. And faith that grows stronger. And because Abraham's faith was the real deal, the genuine article, verse 22, 22, this is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. You see, very simply, Abraham was offered adoption into a family. And he packed up his bags and he moved in. Abraham was offered a, a fortune and he handed over his bank details. Abraham was offered a ceasefire in the cosmic battle and he walked over the enemy lines and he received as he acted by faith faith. It was trust. That's all it was. Simple trust. Nothing but trust. Naked trust. And the character of Abraham's faith was determined by the character of the God in whom he had put his faith. That's the way to think about it. He believed in the God who gave life from the dead and was strengthened in the light of that. And the wonderful thing about this example is that it is an example for us. 
verse 23. Uh, But the words, it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord. You see, Abraham is here wonderfully as the example of faith, and he is that. But he's also our forefather in the faith. He, he is, he was the first person to express faith as it truly should be expressed by even us down into the 21st century. You see, Abraham had the promises in seed form, but we've seen them in full flowering. You see, we express our faith uh, in the same God's. The God who calls into existence things that do not exist. I had no justification of my own. It simply did not exist. But God called it into existence. We believe in the same promises. A a, a multitude of nations that would come from him. And here we are tonight. We believe in the God who operates in the same way. Life from the dead. Spiritually speaking, we were dead. We had no hope. But now we're alive in Christ. Same hopeless situation. Death marked our experience, just as death marked Abraham's experience. But the same wonderful results, righteousness imputed from God and a multitude of nations. You can see the connection, can't you, between the same God, the same promises, the same results. And as a consequence, we conclude it's the very same faith. We have faith in the same God. And in the same promises, despite appearances, think about it for a moment. Is there any one of us who can look back over the last few hours, let alone the last week, and claim before God that we should be righteous? No, there's nothing in, our, in the appearance in front of us that suggests we should be righteous. And yet, despite appearances, by faith, we can be righteous. And as we continue to put our trust in God, so that faith will grow stronger. Talk to anyone who's been a Christian for a number of years. Talk to an elderly Christian still going strong in the faith. And they will tell you their faith is stronger today than it was when they first believed. Now the character of our faith is the same as the character of Abraham's faith. If you like, Abraham stood at the end of a tunnel, a long dark tunnel. But he could see the glimmer of light at the end of it. And he determined to walk through the tunnel. Well, we stand at the other end of the tunnel in the glorious, majestic daylight that is the full flowering of the promises of God in and through the person of Jesus Christ. You see, faith like Abraham's is faith in Jesus. Let me tell you two things about that faith that are wonderful for us to enjoy today. First of all, that faith is in something that's objective, that is objective. That is to say that the subject of our faith is unshakable and in history. Talked about the God, haven't we, who gives life from the dead. Well, that same God put down a marker in history. 2,000 years ago, he sent his son into the world. He came into the world. He lived. He died. And then what happened? He rose from the dead. Or specifically, God raised him from the dead. It's a marker in history that proves that God is that God who gives life from the dead. Which means that the Christian is not putting their faith in something ethereal and intangible that might disappear. We're not being asked to trust in a word that's come out of a cave in the Middle East. Or uh, or being asked to trust in in a sort of tingly feeling that we get because of a religious experience. We're not being asked to trust in some uncanny sixth sense that might just carry us through we're not being asked to close our eyes and hope for the best no we are being asked to trust in the objective act that is the life death and resurrection of jesus christ bang smack in the middle of history unarguably there it is and that's what we're putting our trust in and dawkins and co can continue to to put out this picture of faith as something that is unreasonable a leap in the dark they can Beat that straw man to death if they like, but that is not Christian faith. Christian faith is in the objective act of history, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And personally, I have found that to be hugely helpful in my Christian walk. Because there are times, aren't there, and you will know this, that the questions come into your mind, that the doubts begin to rear their heads. 
It might be intellectual questions. It might be as you see your friends take a very different path in life that seems successful and prosperous, and you wonder, have I been a fool in going in this direction? In those moments, I've tried to train myself to look back 2,000 years to look at the life of Jesus, to look at the death of Jesus, and specifically, and perhaps most importantly of all, to look at the resurrection of Jesus. Because there is an objective, unshakable, testified to event. And I can put my trust in it. It speaks of reality and how it really is, despite appearances. I found it to be helpful when the doubts come into my mind. I found it to be helpful as well when sin rears its head. Because again, sin does do that, doesn't it? It rears its head and it says, you can't be a justified person. You are very simply too bad. You've fallen into that old sin that you wish you could be rid of. Uh, You stuffed up spectacularly. You're someone who can't be justified. But in history, there is an objective action that took place. The life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ that testifies to this justification such that when we doubt, when we wobble, when we waver, when we question, we can look back and see it and be built up and given confidence again. It is objective in history. But then secondly, it's effective. You see those last words of verse 25. Let's read the whole verse. He speaks of Jesus there who was delivered up for our trespass and raised for our justification. Those words there, raised to life for our justification, um, speak of the resurrection of Jesus Christ as being, if you like, a declaration that the death of Jesus was effective on our behalf. That the death of Jesus in which he conquered death and made possible our justification. And so the resurrection was, was, was God's verdict that it had been successful and therefore he raised Jesus to life. Death no longer had a hold over him. He was raised to life for our justification. If you like, the resurrection of Jesus was the victory march of a conquering king who had conquered death. And as we look at the resurrection, we see justification made effective for us. He was raised to life for our justification. It's effective. And there's one thing I need in life. Do you know that? There's one thing I need in life. It's justification. I need to be accepted by God. That's what justification is. I need to be given a righteousness that I might relate to him rightly. It's what we spend so much of our lives trying to achieve. We scrabble around in our days trying to, trying to be righteous, trying to be justified, maybe by our colleagues, maybe by our peers, maybe by our families, whoever it is, we spend our time trying to be justified. We try to accumulate a moral CV. We try to top up our moral bank balance time and again. We long to be, to be righteous, maybe through a religious system, maybe through a, a philosophy or an ideology. We all do it all the time. It's the one thing really we want at the end of the day because it's the one thing that we need, but there is only one place I can find that righteousness that I truly need. It's at the cross of Jesus and at the empty tomb. He was handed over for our trespasses and raised to life for our justification. And when we go to the resurrection of Jesus, we will find something there that is both effective and trustworthy. It is something that we can put our trust in. It will hold water It will carry the weight that we want to put on it. It will do what it needs to do. It is right for our justification. And so my prayer for us, really from these three or four weeks, is that we would be people with robust faith. Turn back to chapter 1 and verse 8 of Romans, just a couple of pages back. I love this description of the, the Roman church. That Paul starts with. He says, First, I thank my God, verse 8, through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the worlds. In a sense, that's my prayer for us here tonight, that ours collectively would be a faith that is proclaimed in all the worlds, not for our glory, but for the glory of the God who raised Jesus Christ from the dead for our justification. Let's pray.
Our Heavenly Father, we know this to be true, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's not one of us who can come to you and declare our own righteousness. And so we're very grateful. We're very grateful that you have made a righteousness available to us through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we ask, Father, that you would help us to put our faith in it. If we've never done that, Father, we pray that tonight that you'd help us to have faith. And then that we'd continue on in that faith. Faith like Abraham's, Father, would you grow our faith in strength, despite how the world would cut against it. And we pray, Father, that our faith would become known. We pray that it would become known in our offices, in our homes, in our communities, in our families, Lord, wherever we go, that our faith would become famous. But we don't ask it for our own glory, Lord. We ask it so that this promise to Abraham might be fulfilled. The righteousness of faith among the nations. We long to see more and more people coming to this faith, Father. So we pray, strengthen ours to that end for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Please look round this way. And we're... We're going to ask Jamie questions for about 15 minutes, I think. Um, one consequence of not providing question slips is some of them are written on very small bits of paper. So I'm going to try and not throw them everywhere. Um, I've given Jamie one to start with um, while I sort through them. You said that Christianity is not irrational, um, but Abraham's faith wasn't purely based on reason. How much should we use reason when we're talking to people, evangelizing? How big a part should that play? Um, I suppose it depends a little bit what you mean by the question. We should use reason all the time. We're just, I mean, we're reasonable people. We don't want to be uh, irrational in our discussion. But that doesn't mean that we're prayerless. We must recognize that it's a spiritual work. Paul in Romans 1 describes how all humanity, to a man, to a woman, a boy, and a girl, we all by nature suppress the truth about God, such that even when the most compelling evidence is put in front of us, we are irrational and we will suppress it. And it's only a miracle that can, can break that down. Uh, so whilst we are reasonable in our approach, we don't want to be prayerless. It's a miracle that will bring people to faith. Um, but <clears throat> I said in like Christianity is not uh, irrational, it's rational, it's reasonable. And there are probably lots of places we can go. For the sake of time, let me go to the place I, I like to go most often, and you could tell this from tonight, to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It, it just stands in history as an objective fact with a compelling weight of evidence behind it and again uh, Charlie you might have some, some more things to throw in but um, you could point to an empty tomb of, uh, sorry no, you could point to a dead body first of all Jesus very clearly died killed by professionals whose life themselves was at stake had they not killed Jesus he definitely died but then you point to an empty tomb he was definitely raised uh, it wouldn't have been that the soldiers would have taken him because um, they would have just produced the body. It can't have been that the religious authorities um, took, the, took the body. They would have produced it at the right time. There was an empty tomb. And then Jesus, of course, appeared. And he appeared to um, hundreds of people who could testify and did testify for years um, that he was alive. And that produced disciples who were willing to go to their deaths for the sake of that. Now, there's more we could say, but we probably need to keep moving. But the, the resurrection is where I would go time and again, this objective historical fact that is compelling and worth putting your faith in. Thank you. Um, one very good question here. I'm still unclear as to what faith is. Can I have a seven-word summary? <laughs> no? Let's see what we can come up with from Romans. It's important because so many, so many <clears throat> of our friends think they know what faith is and what we mean by it. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to give you a seven-word summary because I'll spend more time thinking about shopping words than will be useful. I've, st I've, I've talked, haven't I, about how faith is the, the open hand that receives. The open hand that receives. Now, that's what's required of us as Christians, simply to receive the grace that has been given to us. And so faith is simply to receive. You see how it's worked out in the life of Abraham. If you want a concrete example... 
Well, look at the life of Abraham. Just read the last seven verses again. You'll see what faith looks like in practice. Seven verses rather than seven words. But that's what faith looks like. But faith is simply the open hand that receives. Thank you very much. Um, We've got some sort of detailed questions. Let's see if we can do some of those quite briefly. Could you please explain verses 24 to 25? I thought our faith came through believing in Jesus. Just try and work out what what you're talking about. Do I, believe it, is it, do I believe in Jesus or do I believe in some promises? Is that the... Yeah, it's all kind of tied up. Actually, in verses 24 and 25, uh, we believe in him who raised Jesus from the dead, don't we, rather than in Jesus. I, I'm denied with that heading, whether to go with faith in the God who raised Jesus or, or faith in Jesus, faith in the promises. I think they're all tied up together. I don't want to d- divide and say, oh, no, it's in, a, it's in a promise rather than in a person. It's in a person, God, who makes promises in and through Jesus Christ. So he's the object of our faith. So, um, one package that we put our trust in. Same thing. Thank you. Um, some things about how you get faith and how important it is. So, God revealed himself to Abraham, that's why he had faith. Um, how, how does that work for us now? So, um, there was another one about God spoke to Abraham directly, but how do we have faith? <clears throat> Thank you, yeah. Um, so, Romans goes on and talks about how faith comes by hearing uh, so the first thing we need to do is hear. Uh, it's difficult to know exactly how Abraham did hear. Yeah, God, it appears, just spoke to him directly. Um, now the promise is that every time we open God's word, that's, that's how he speaks. Um, and as we articulate the truths of God's words to our friends. So there is a very real sense in which it is a, a, a rational process between one mind and another, or particularly that, that mind expressed, the mind of God expressed in his word Um, that's how it happens. You hear what he says about who he is and what he's done, and you put your trust in it. But that is also, as I think I've said already, a spiritual process, a divine process. It needs God to um, shine light into our hearts. That's how Paul puts it in a different bit of the Bible in 2 Corinthians. He needs to break down the barrier that we put up, uh, and that's a miracle. Ephesians 4 talks... uh, Ephesians... um, I beg your pardon, speaks of how even faith actually is a gift of God. So um, we've talked about faith as being something that that we do, and there's something in that. We are the ones who receive, but we even need God to give us the ability to have faith. That's because by nature we suppress the truth. We need God to give us the ability to receive truth and to have faith. So it's it's a miracle from beginning to end, faith. And at the same time, it's a normal, rational process. Thank you. That was the next question. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, someone, so is it right for God to do this? So how does Paul write this when we know Abraham went and had an illegitimate son? So that's partly Abraham wasn't such a nice bloke, was he? Why, why, is, that, why is he included? But also his not wavering, I think. Yeah, yeah. It's, I, I, it's, a, it's a tricky one because there are moments where Abraham looks like he seriously wavers. I mean, maybe with the, with the Hagar-Ishmael thing, so if you don't know the story, Abraham has made this promise, and then um, he and Sarah kind of have this wobble and come up with this plan that maybe Abraham should sleep with um, Sarah's um, servant, Hagar, and that's how the promise is going to come about. Now, in that instance, it might be that you can just see that as a seriously misguided attempt to make the promise come about. The faith was still there. It was just misguided in how to bring it about. But even then, there are places where Abraham looks as though he just is kind of disbelieving. He he just can't bring himself to believe in it. I think all we can do is trust what Paul tells us about that account, that even though Abraham hit an all-time low on his knees before God with his, um, his, his, his arms open, looking like he's disbelieving, even then there was just a, a seed of faith. Uh, Paul says he didn't waver. There was faith there all the time. And, and if Paul's right, therefore, and I, we've got to trust him that he is because this is God's words, then that's an encouragement to us, I think, because there will be times in our Christian walks where we will, we will drop to our knees and question, God, can you really keep these promises to me? Can I really be righteous? Is it really true? And at those moments when it feels like our faith is just, just a very flickering light, even in those moments, that's faith. And God will honour that faith. And how about the second part, though? Given Abraham's such a mixed character, how is it right for him to have righteousness? Oh, yeah, well, that's the beauty of the Christian message, isn't it? It has nothing to do with us. 
that uh, means we receive this grace. It was nothing to do with Abraham. It wasn't because Abraham was an upstanding character that God came to him. It's not because you are an upstanding character that God has come to you if you're a Christian person tonight, or me. It is purely by grace. And so it's sinners who receive. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's sinners who receive. We've got to believe that about ourselves. Um, And so it doesn't really matter that Abraham wasn't an upstanding character because that's not how you receive this righteousness from God. It is purely by faith from first to last. And and someone says, how's that right if if Jesus hadn't died yet? How does that work for Abraham? Okay, yeah, so um, we turn back to Romans 3 and week 1 to see that. Romans 3, verse 25, halfway through the verse there, speaking of the, uh, the sacrificial work of Christ on the cross, he says, this was to show God's righteousness because in, the, in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. Speaking there, I think probably of Abraham and of David, who he's going to come to, who, um, who he accepted as righteous, even though they had done awful things and all before Christ. I guess because they were trusting in the promises of God, even though the the work of Christ came after them, nonetheless, God, who is timeless after all, was able to take the righteousness that Christ made possible and to make it effective for Abraham, even though he was pre-Christ. He passed over it at the time, but that's okay, because he proved himself to be righteous at the moment when Jesus died on the cross. Thank you. Um, I've got three questions left, basically. I think the last one's the one that most people put in, so I'd like us to leave time for that one. But So what, I guess two about the negatives. So one, hang on a moment. Are you saying I'm dead if I'm not a Christian? Um, I think Paul is saying that, and I want to agree with him. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the Bible's verdict on us if we're not a Christian person. It's the Bible's verdict on every single person in humanity. I'm not being personal to you if you wouldn't call yourself a Christian tonight. Before God breaks into our hearts, the Bible describes us as, as being dead, simply unable to bring ourselves back to life. Our sin has caused this spiritual death. And it's, I know it's not politically correct at all, but that's just how we are. Uh, And the Bible says it again and again. Look to places like Ephesians 2 to see that verdict. Because we're trapped under sin, slaves, unable to free ourselves, dead. Um, So yes, that is the Bible's verdict on us. But wonderfully, that means that the God who is grace can bring us to life again. That's what he came to do. He didn't just come to make us slightly better people. He came to bring us to life again through the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. Thank you. And... That if we phrase the next question the same way, because we're three doing the same thing, um, are you saying that kind of works-based ways don't, don't get us there? So the, the questions are things like, any practical tips, those who, who, who don't kind of feel that? How do we avoid falling back into the trap of deeds-based? Um, how do we resist the pressure to justify ourselves? And things that, I think that's how it works. Yeah, it's difficult. But it, it's difficult because that's what we're like by nature. Uh, we, are, we are self-justifiers by nature. And you'll walk out of this room tonight and that, that instinct will, will claw back. And I think all we can say is we've got to keep reminding ourselves of the gospel, of God's verdict on us and what we're like by nature. So verse 23 of chapter 3, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God's. Um, that's God's verdict on what we're like by nature and so any attempt to get right with him by our own works will just fall short we'll find ourselves doing it again and again and we've got to go back and remember God's verdict on what our best efforts are like filthy rags to him but the wonderful thing about that is as we go back and remind ourselves of God's verdict on us so we get to enjoy his grace again and again and again and we grow and we grow like that Um, so I think we've got to keep going back to God's word. It's simple, isn't it? You might have been expecting something radically different. But just go back to God's word. Remind yourself of the gospel. Remind yourself of what the Bible says about what we're like and what our works are like by nature. But then remember the grace of God shown to us and the works will come flowing out in the light of the grace that he's given us. Thank you. Then um, the biggest area of questions, I think this is probably where we could all most usefully spend our time talking to each other afterwards, are are about sort of stronger faith, weaker faith, 
doubts, that kind of area. So um, someone going through hard times who doesn't feel like their faith is very strong at the moment. Um, how do we keep living by faith um, when all we can see is the world around us? Someone who uh, been a keen Christian for over 10 years but thinks their faith is less sharp, less strong than it was. How do I know if I have enough faith? Is there room for doubt? Is faith something that can be measured? What does growing faith look like? Do you want to start us off on what can we usefully be talking to each other? Because I guess we'll all feel different. It may even depend how we, what sort of day we've had, whether we feel like today we have strong faith or weak faith. Mm -hmm. What to say? There's lots we could say about this, I guess. Let's, let's remember that faith is not a work, first of all. Faith is not a work. And the, the smallest faith, the slightest faith, the, the just clinging on by our fingertips faith is counted to us as righteousness. Not because it's worthy, but because of the object of our faith. And that's what we've got to remember. It's the thing we put our faith in. There's a, there's a phrase, isn't there, that for every look within, take ten looks at him. If you look into your heart, indeed, if you even study and examine your faith, then you'll begin to doubt because your faith will wander and meander. And you will find that there are times in life when your faith feels very weak. And if your confidence is in your faith and its strength, then that's shaky ground on which to put your confidence. But if you look at him, the God who made these promises, the God who spoke to Abraham and supremely the God who sent Jesus Christ to die and rise again. If you look at him and feed on him and think on him and pray about him, then you'll find, I think, that your faith grows because the object becomes more vivid and more real to you. Does it, what would that feel like for your faith to grow? What are you, what are you talking yeah, about? What do you mean? Older Christians will do a better job of talking about this. I think you'll, you, you will feel a greater confidence in what God has done you won't feel more we shouldn't feel more worthy or more acceptable you will just feel more and more confident in what God has done for you you may feel a, 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 a greater kind of communion with him a more a closeness though our feelings aren't always to be trusted but you will find yourself acting more in faith you will find I think your life comes into line with the faith that you have you will start um, doing things that are maybe more courageous. I think Abraham is a model in this sense. Genesis 22 shows a great act of faith of someone who had had faith for a while. But nonetheless, we've got to keep resisting the temptation to, keep look, to look at those deeds or to look at the strength of faith that we might feel or the communion with God that we enjoy. Uh, instead, we've got to remember the union with God that we enjoy. That's a, an important difference in the Christian life. As soon as we, ex we come to faith in Jesus, we are united to him once and for all unbreakably, unshakably. And there may be times in life when we enjoy a deeper communion with him as our faith grows. But that has nothing to do with the union itself. So keep going back to Christ. Keep enjoying him, feeding on him. And as you do so, the faith will, I think, grow. But because of sin in our life, because of suffering in our experience, it may take blows along the way. And we've got to be real about that and, uh, and, and almost expect it. So that when those times come, rather than despair, we go back to Jesus, to his death in our place and his resurrection for our justification. Thank you. So, so, yeah, so if we're now, our faith is going backwards or we feel there's less there, that hasn't changed our justification, no. hasn't changed our status with God. Just so in three bullet points, what, if you were having that conversation over at After Eights tonight with someone who's feeling like that, where would you take them? What would you talk to them about? I, t I take them to the cross and to the, the work of Jesus Christ on their behalf. Because it doesn't matter how they feel tonight. It doesn't matter um, what they've done in the past. It doesn't matter how slight their faith is. His work is done. And for anyone who puts their trust in him, it's effective. And we've got to just keep going back to the cross, therefore. And that's where I take people to the cross and the resurrection of Jesus, standing there as testimony to our justification. That's where we look to gain our confidence and to be built up again. And it may take time. It might not be that if you come here with frail feeling faith tonight, you'll walk out the door renewed and buoyant and full of energy. It might take time and prayer. But as you feed on him, on what he did for you, it'll come back. Thank you. For, let's, we're going to sing now. We're going to sing enjoying our status as children of faith, people of faith. Um, so please let's stand and let's sing.